Hello, everybody. Welcome to Raising Multilinguals Live. My name is Tetsu Young from Ask Tetsu. Hello, and my name is Ute Lima Haribold from Ute's International Lounge. And hello, welcome. My name is Rita Rosenbach from multilingualparenting.com. And today we have an absolutely fantastic honor to have Professor Ellen Bialystok from the York University to, to join us. And uh, welcome, Ellen. So happy, happy to have you here. Thank you. And um, today we are going to speak about um, mainly about cognitive advantages of bilingualism. So what, how does your child um, get, what, how does your child benefit from being bilingual? And we are speaking about the cognitive aspect and to define cognitive Oh, please do correct me if I'm wrong, Ellen, but as I understand it, it is how we learn, understand, and how we think, and, and how we apply what we have learned into our lives. Would that be a good? Excellent, A plus. <laughs> Thank you. So Ellen, please do tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, what, what, you, and what you do, what your, what your work entails. Okay, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and speaking to you today. I uh, started as a developmental psychologist interested in language and thought. Now, I've been doing this for over 40 years, and I was always interested in how children's language learning is connected or not to children's cognitive development, how they understand the world, how they're able to learn about the world. And after some years looking at these questions, I stumbled, in fact, on this set of findings in our research that showed that children who could speak more than one language were doing certain cognitive things differently than monolingual children. They weren't approaching the nonverbal cognitive world in exactly the same way. And in particular, when you could narrow down what was different, it was striking that what it came down to was their ability to focus attention on what is important and ignore distraction in order to come up with the correct answer. Now, when we go out into the world, we are bombarded by a million things a minute and we just shut them out. We don't pay attention to what isn't important, but some things are very salient. And this idea that bilingual children were somehow better than monolingual children at focusing attention on what they needed to look at was compelling. And I'm going to explain this point with a single example that we discovered in our research. This is 30 years ago. We were interested in how children develop metalinguistic knowledge. This is the understanding that language has structure, it has grammar, it has meaning. You need to know all this if you're going to learn how to read. And there were a lot of studies at the time in the 1970s and early 80s on how children acquire metalinguistic knowledge, metalinguistic awareness. And one way people study that is by asking children, because they can do this, to just tell you if sentences are grammatical or not. So I'm going to give you a sentence. Tell me if it's said the right way. And that gives you a sense of whether or not children have an understanding of grammar. So we did something slightly different without realizing where it was going to go. We ask children to make these kinds of judgments about sentences. So just tell me if the sentence is said the right way. Apples on trees grow. Is that said the right way? And any child learning English and having some understanding of word order will say, no, it's said the wrong way. Fine. But we included sentences that were said the right way, but were silly. And we trained the children to say, remember, just say if it's said the right way. 
Some of the sentences will be silly, but that's okay. It's fun to be silly. Just say if it's said the right way. Apples grow on noses. Well, the kids would keel over with it laughing and say, no, it's wrong. Just tell me if it's said the right way. And only the bilingual kids could do that. And now that was our first hint that they are attending differently. All the kids knew perfectly well that the sentence was silly, but only the bilingual kids could set that aside. So that started this research program that we've been looking at for the last 30 years, um, investigating how bilingualism changes the way you use attention to focus on what you need to be focusing on and not be distracted. Uh, the the uh, evolution of that research is that we've now conducted studies across the entire lifespan, including looking at patient populations in older age to show how these changes in attention that are shaped by bilingual experience uh, continue across the lifespan and continue to modify cognitive ability throughout life. So, so what is it in, in, in that particular, for, for what you just mentioned about the, the ability to focus and, and to, to avoid distraction. So what is it that bilinguals do that kind of make their brain more efficient at staying focused. Well, well where, where's the connection, so to say? Yeah, yeah, okay, where's the connection? Excellent, where's the connection? So at this point, we speculate, and here's what I think the connection is, and here's some evidence to support what I'm going to tell you. So it is now well known, it's very well established that for bilinguals like yourselves who are able to communicate in more than one language, it is now well established that all of those languages are simultaneously active in your brain, even when only one of them is required. So right now, even though you're only using your English ability to have this conversation, all of those other languages you know are also being fired and available. So why don't you make mistakes? Bilinguals rarely get confused. They don't insert the wrong language. You could slip a little if you're tired or with aging, but basically you don't make language intrusion errors. Why not? And so the idea here is that being in a bilingual environment is a way um, requires that you shape those focus attention processes so that you are only focusing on the language you need. In exactly the way the kids had to focus on the order of the words in that sentence, like um, apples grow on noses, and pay no attention to the fact that that's a really ridiculous sentence, your brain learns to focus on what you need. So that's our story that bilinguals, because that's how the brain is configured with multiple languages, are therefore always recruiting these attention processes and using them. The remarkable thing, however, the most, I think, among the most amazing research in bilingualism is that that ability to focus attention can be shown in the first year of life before infants say a word but are in an environment where they hear multiple languages their attention processes and focusing ability are already being developed and shaped by simply being in a bilingual environment. So I think the answer to your question, Rita, is that it's the need to attend to the right language, the relevant language for this moment, when the context 
is presenting a great deal of distraction. The attention process is shaped through the experience and becomes uh, more efficient. That's absolutely fantastic. So that means every time we communicate or it, um, we are more or less training our brain to, to, yeah. to focus. Yeah. And is that ongoing through, through, through the life? So is, is that, let's say if a monolingual learns a language later on in life, will they also get this uh, advantage? Okay, so what I think is going on here is that, so this is what we would call experience-dependent plasticity. Plasticity means that your brain is changing. Experience-dependent means it's changing because of engagement in an experience. So these attentional uh, changes that we see in bilinguals come as you say, from the experience of using two languages all the time in your life. So experience dependent plasticity has to be interpreted that the more experience you have, the more we can expect to see these changes. So if we're looking at learning to play the piano, Everyone knows perfectly well that if you want to play better, you have to practice more. And the longer you practice, the better you'll play. Now, you have an advantage if you start playing when you're a young child because you have more years to practice. But you could start piano lessons as a middle-aged adult and then put in 10 or 20 or 30 years of practicing, and that too will build up. So because it's experience dependent, it's tied to how much practice you are able to have with this. And obviously starting younger means that there's potential for more practice, but it's not ruled out later. Fantastic. Um, I wonder if it's, a, if it's okay, if we pick a question that, that has come in just recently just a, a few minutes ago, that's quite relevant to what you were talking about just, just a few minutes ago about bilinguals having to focus on one of the two languages. Uh, we have Elisa uh, asking us, does it work in the same way with multilingual children? So now she's asking uh, for those who speak more than two languages, is it the same? So I've heard before that when you speak a specific language, you are not only actively focusing on this language, but you're also actively shutting down the, the, the language that you're not speaking. So if we go by that, by that logic, if you have more than one language that you need to shut down, it costs you more, I guess, in, in, in mind energy, correct? So what's okay. the, so what are your so thoughts it's a really on good that? Question. It's a really good question, and it's actually a very complex question. So first, I, 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 yeah, say, I'm sure. <laughs> first, but first, let me say that research that has specifically looked at the difference between children who speak two languages versus children who speak three or more languages, that research exists and it's not very clear. Mm. There isn't a simple uh, answer to that. So sure. let me talk about some of the factors. So, so first, Tetsu, you're right, that you do sort of shut down the other languages, but the fact is you never really shut them down entirely, which is what creates this situation. So if I'm looking at these little, uh, boxes on my screen where you are all laid out in some kind of a pattern. If I'm focusing on you, Tetsu, I haven't shut out the other boxes. They're still there, but they're getting far less of my attention. So that's how it is with language. You focus more on the one you need to be speaking now, and you don't ever shut down the other one, but it gets less attention. So it's more of a seesaw relative balancing act. What happens then with kids who are learning two or three languages, uh, three or four languages? So one thing I like to point out is that if we're talking about really little kids and they're building up proficiency in more than one language, there is absolutely no doubt that they have the 
number, they have enough time that they're awake during a day, enough actual language input opportunities, and a lot, enough social interaction to build up reasonable proficiency in two languages. That's clear. Do they also have enough of all those resources to build up reasonable proficiency in three or more languages? And I'm talking about kids who are two, three, four years old. And maybe they do, but maybe they don't. And what often happens is that the third language ends up looking a bit like a tag on. Not a fully developed system, but maybe just something that they can say enough in to get their grandmother to give them the kind of food they want, or something like that. But not really a fully developed language system. And it's not because their brains aren't big enough or good enough, but because language learning requires all of those things that I mentioned. It requires exposure and opportunity and speakers and so on. So are kids going to equally well learn multiple languages? It depends. And the other, I think, part of that question, although I've just clicked it off, maybe I can get it back. Um, right. Doesn't work. So the, the other part of that question is how are these languages managed and what other people ask as well, although it's not explicit in that question is, do whatever cognitive outcomes follow from learning yeah. two languages increase if you're learning three languages? And there the answer is probably not. Probably not. So it's the act of needing to manage multiple language systems um, that creates some adjustment in these attention processes rather than a linear relationship between you get this much benefit <laughs> from having two and add it on if you have three. It's not linear as far as I can tell. That's too bad. <laughs> yes, and um, maybe can I add something because it, it's very interesting uh, when we speak about uh, acquiring these languages at an early stage and adding more to the uh, to the equation or to the plate. Um, sometimes then we have also the, the language shift that say that one language that was very important at the beginning might become less important later uh, in life and uh, then still the other languages are still there. My question now is thinking a little bit more ahead, not thinking about the young children, but about uh, teenagers or, or adults who then maybe um, grew up in a highly multilingual environment and they learn different languages and all of a sudden they find themselves in contexts where they use only one or two of them. Um, can you say something about the, the cognitive yeah benefit of this or what is happening in in their brains then yeah i can and um and so i i want to go back to this same kind of uh, metaphor i was using before so let's say you take piano lessons and you work really hard and and you practice three hours a day for 10 years and then you don't touch the instrument for the next 10 years what's going to happen uh it's the same um, the, that the brain is always responding to what it's doing at the moment and experience needs to be constantly um, experienced actually that you know, need to be constantly doing this so your first point about dominance changing throughout life this is absolutely true you know kids go to school and the school language becomes uh, more salient than the home language and then you go off this is absolutely true dominance changes but when one language actually drops out um then you become less bilingual and, and that is just because this is process dependent this is based on use there is um this is not a static um structuralist idea that you have little boxes in your brain that hold the language this is a much more dynamic process idea that your brain is always engaged in using more than one language 
I wanted to go back a little bit to when we talked about like uh, having two languages and maybe the third one is, is an add-on. That was kind of, um, I just want to speak about it a bit more. So, so because I know there are so many uh, families that have three, four or more languages and, um, and uh, that, uh, that's at one point in time. So maybe at that point they don't have uh, enough to, uh, so the, all the languages become equally proficient. But um, what happens in children's lives as well, that they, they maybe spend more time with, with the speaker, like two months um, with, with, with someone who speaks one language, and then maybe they spend, uh, go to school, maybe during the summer there. So they spend in an other language environment. So they can, I mean, we are speaking about, uh, do we have then simultaneous or sequential um, bilinguals that doesn't really matter but but i just don't want parents to feel discouraged that a third a third or further languages isn't possible because it is we 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 have seen it that it does work it's it, just, it does uh, require more from parents and more focus and can exactly what you say ellen that there needs to be the exposure the input and the, the need to, to use those languages. So. Well, I would go further. It, it, it's even better than that. I mean, I was talking about what's the chance you're gonna be a you know, perfectly fluent trilingual yeah. or something, and I said, yeah, maybe not. But it goes further than that because exposure to these languages is laying down the groundwork for that language. And so even if the child picks up the language 10 years later, it's not starting from nothing. So you already have a basis for the language. So none of it is wasted. And it's all contributing towards these language competencies that, as you say, they, they can be four or five languages, no problem at all. Um, you know, how many of them is the child gonna really learn to a high level when they're four? I think, you know, that was my more restrictive. Yeah interpretation but no of course not and the language basis by even having just you know two hours a week um with grandma uh when you're little and then not hearing that language until later in life you've got something to work with so the language is absolutely there um and there are people who argue and um, these arguments tend to be anecdotal. I don't know a lot of actual evidence, but there are arguments. One uh, is, has was made to me by a very eminent psychologist who claims he was raised very multilingually and now reports as an adult, he feels he doesn't or didn't have one language that he really spoke well. So his personal impression, this is anecdote, is that uh, being required to spread out his childhood over these, I think, three languages, easily three languages, made him feel that there was not a language that was his own. Now there's a whole sociology of languages, sociolinguistics of language that includes things like identity, and affiliation and all kinds of stuff that people may well confuse with language proficiency. So I don't know if that's what's going on here, but it's not, it's not irrelevant because kids are developing whole, their whole selves. They're developing a sense of who they are, what they speak, who their family is. So these questions may seem kind of peripheral mm -hmm. and the answers may even be wrong. Like maybe he's wrong and that one of his languages or two of his languages were native-like, but he didn't believe they were. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about kids, that matters too. And so we're talking about raising children. That's what we're talking about. We have to focus on all of it, not just their, their sort of measurable objective proficiency. Yeah, and bilinguals are well known for underestimating their own skills and, and uh, thinking that only an accent-free 
um, perfect <laughs> command of a language uh, that then you can call yourself fluent. That that's uh, that's very common among us, as we all know. Mm. Did we want to? Did we have some other questions that we wanted to take? Yes. Um, yes, there is one from uh, Michelle. Uh, she says, good evening, Professor Bialystok. Uh, what are your views on language repertoires and cross-linguistic practices, such as code switching and translanguaging as pedagogy within multilingual classroom environments? So it's uh, in education. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is, I, I don't research this, but I know that this is now a very active new area of research. And I know some of the people who do this research so I'm just going to report what I've learned from these people who do the research. Um, and then I'll tell you why I think it's probably true. What people who study this say is, not only is translanguaging and classroom code switching not a problem, but also it's beneficial. And that it actually serves a positive pedagogical role in bringing the kid along by giving them more pieces that they can use. So that, as I understand it, is the current um, position on translanguaging in education settings, which is go for it, it's a good thing. Why do I think it's okay? I think it's okay because despite the tremendous fear and anxiety of parents, kids are not confused about which language they're speaking. And what the code switching studies with young children have shown, and I'm thinking now about studies from 30 years ago that Fred Genesee did some really clever studies. What the uh, studies show is that kids know precisely which language they are supposed to be speaking to which person, but when they are unable to meet the linguistic demands, they will strategically bring in um, resources from a different language, which comes out as a code switch, but it's actually very clever strategic behavior to keep communication going. So if kids aren't confused, if kids aren't confused about what language it is, then there's no risk in a classroom about mixing the languages because we can assume then that the kids know and what you're doing is giving more kinds of scaffolds, more support. You didn't know the word in this language, let me try it here to build the concept that we're dealing with. So there is no, the premise is uh, for being worried about code switching and trans language, trans languaging, the premise would be you should not do them because it's confusing. But there's no evidence whatsoever that kids are confused about which language is which. Um, and again, I'm going to go back to remarkable research with infants, pre verbal infants can tell the languages apart. They don't get confused either. So there's just no problem about it. So give kids as many of these resources as possible when we're trying to develop their concepts. Yes, um, may I, um, thank you. That's very clear. <laughs> thank you for reiterating that. It's not confusing at all. Um, we have a question that, uh, links to what you said before about uh, what kind of input the children need to have or one needs to have in order to um, yes acquire and learn the languages and it's a question from Josie if the language input is only music as a child will this still be enough for later language not starting from the beginning so this is I think she's teaching or she's introducing languages that she doesn't speak herself, but uh, that she would like her children to get exposed to. Um, I was mean, speaking about song, songs, songs and uh, different listening languages? to songs and, and uh, oh, oh, I see. 
Uh, I don't really know. I mean, kids can repeat the songs. That doesn't mean that they've necessarily learned the language um, that the song is in. I mean, we all learn Grammy Jacques, Grammy Jacques. We had no idea what it meant, <laughs> but we could sing it. So I'm not sure that that is um, adequate input to, um, to introduce the language. I mean, it would they're, be more. They're, they're, I think be in the context of other stuff, then maybe so, but mm -hmm. only that, possibly not. Because the important aspect of interaction is yeah. is missing there, and and there is no, and it's right. kind of what somebody once told me that if you listen, you if you just hear something, you learn to learn to listen. If you just read something, you learn to read. But to be able to learn to speak, you need to interact. So. Right. So there's studies with kids learning a first language. I mean, just language learning in general, comparing interactions with a real human and being plopped in front of a screen and, you know, watching TV or something. And there's no comparison. You need interaction. Mm, very good. Great. So uh, with regard, uh, regards to the advantages, so we have spoken about um, focus and then attention. Uh, are there any other cognitive benefits that you would like to, to highlight and, uh, with regards to this aspect of, of uh, the benefits? Right. So to speak about the cognitive benefits, I, I want to clear up a confusion because people confuse the tasks we use to do this research with the cognitive, the psychological processes that we're investigating. So for example, one of the famous um, cognitive tasks that we've shown bilingual adults and pink children, I don't remember, uh, perform better than monolinguals is the, the famous Stroop task. So you see words uh, like red, green, blue, and they're printed in different color ink. So red might be printed in blue ink, green might be printed in yellow ink, and so on. And the task is to not read the word, don't read the word, just say what color the ink is. This is really apples grow on noses, right? You can't block out this stupid image, but that's not what the task is. So this is really what the Stroop task is. So we've shown that adults and older adults who are bilingual um, do better on things like the Stroop task. They can resist reading the word and they'll tell you the color of the ink is green or whatever. Now, people get confused in thinking that that's what I'm claiming the bilingual advantage is, but it's not. I mean, honestly, I don't care if you can do the Stroop task or not. When was the last time somebody stopped you on the street and said, hey, what color is the color of the, the ink? It never comes up. So these are little tools and they should not be over interpreted. And that's why some studies show that bilinguals do the Stroop task better and some studies show they don't. These are just little tools. The important issue, which is absolutely consistent across the lifespan is that when we look at how attention is used and the efficiency with which attention is deployed, bilinguals are better at that than monolinguals. Beginning in infancy, we have evidence from six, seven, eight month old infants showing they are better at attending and shifting attention young children, adults, and older adults. And if these little tools like this group task don't show that the groups have different overall scores, when you look in their brains, it is clear they are using attention differently. So we have um, Im imaging that looks at brain, um, brain scans or the electrophysiology using EEG. And there's always a difference. So even when they're performing these tasks to the same level, what is clear across the lifespan is that bilinguals are more efficient at recruiting attention in complex situations. Now that's not bad. And it's good to know 
you know, during most of our lives, we can do that. But the real payoff comes in older age because the reconfiguration of attention systems in the brain somehow, and still don't know how this happens, has the effect of making the brain more efficient and more able to cope when the cognitive systems begin to fail. So there's now research from all over the world, this has been replicated dozens of times, showing that as older adults become cognitively impaired, that neurological impairment that we can see by using things like brain scans does not affect behavior, does not show up as symptoms in bilinguals for a longer time. So even as things like the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease accumulates in a bilingual brain, bilingual brain is more resilient and can function at a more normal, healthy level for a longer time. So that's, that's a real payoff in older age where this resiliency of the bilingual brain that comes, I believe, through the increased efficiency of attention networks pays off in preserving cognition even in the face of pathology. Fantastic. And also this, um, this um, kind of better ability at attention and focusing that does impact almost everything else that we do when we're trying to learn something, trying to get something done. So, so although we said it, that it's, it, the focus is on the attention and the focus, but that has so many other domino effects. Right. Because exactly. In, in, that's exactly right. And, the, and that, I'm glad you put it that way because that's why I'm saying I, I don't want to talk about these stupid tasks like the scoop task or the flanker task. Mm. That's not the, the benefit. They're tools that reveal this underlying change in attentional efficiency that really is the payoff. Fantastic. So we have uh, you spoken about the, the all the advantages. Are you aware of any disadvantages when it came, comes to cognitive ability for, from being bilingual? Um, well, I'll, I'll say two things about that. I'll say first that um, it's pretty clear that bilinguals um, on average, so this isn't every person in every language, but on average, if you have big sample studies, bilinguals have smaller vocabularies in each language than a monolingual speaker of that language. That's a fact. Okay. Um, I don't see that as a particular disadvantage because they also have a whole other language or two or three. So not a problem, but that, that's a reliable statistical effect. Um, the, the idea of a disadvantage is interesting because, <clears throat> as you know, for years, I've been arguing that there are actual cognitive benefits to being bilingual, and I've just been telling you about what some of them are. And recently, there's been a lot of criticism of this work. You may have seen some of this where people say, no, it's not true. I, rep I tried to replicate the experiment and there was no difference between groups. Therefore, I'm wrong. But there's something very bizarre about the logic of that argument. Mm -hmm. No one has ever said that the outcome was that bilinguals would be lower on these cognitive abilities. Now the argument is, are they the same, like these critics are claiming, or are they better? Well, give me a break. Being the same is just fine. 
there's essentially no study that shows they're lower. So I find this a very strange twist of logic to argue that there are no benefits of bilingualism because they don't do better on the Stroop test in my study, to which I say, they do just as well. It's amazing. And they can speak another language. And they, so they I can say, no, there's, there's no deficit. <laughs> yeah, and they can explain to you in two languages or three languages why they didn't do that that well in the <laughs> test. <laughs> Absolutely. No um, downside. Why not? It's, it's really fantastic. Uh, there's one a slightly provocative question, because this is a question I have been asked a few times, because we do speak and I do speak a lot about the advantages, not only cognitive, but there are, uh, there are social, there are even financial, there are a lot of other types of advantages. But if we if still focus on the cognit cognitive advantages. So are we saying that bilingual children are more intelligent than monolingual children? Let me be clear. No. <laughs> First, I don't know what you mean by intelligent. What do we mean by intelligent? Someone had some described intelligence as that which is measured by an intelligence test. That's about as close as anyone's come to saying what you mean by intelligence. What do intelligence tests measure? They measure bits of this and that. Some intelligence tests also measure verbal ability. And on those types of tests, bilinguals typically perform worse than monolinguals. As I've said, they have a lower vocabulary on average in each language. Some types of intelligence tests measure performance ability, others measure reasoning. There is no actual intelligence or clear definition or agreed upon measure of intelligence. So to say that a group is more intelligent than another requires a lot of unpacking. I want to know what specific abilities are you comparing? What kinds of instruments are you using to assess them? Um, and, and so on. So from the view of intelligence testing or intelligence assessment, there's no place for comparing monolinguals and bilinguals. I, I can say a little more about this because I've recently gone back and read the historical literature on this for something that I'm working on. So in the first half of the 20th century, um, up to 1962 to be precise, there was actually a surprising lot of research comparing monolinguals and bilinguals. And all of those studies um, have the title intelligence in them. And they essentially gave intelligence tests to groups of monolingual and bilingual children and compared their scores. Um, for a lot of reasons, the bilingual children invariably did more poorly, but many reasons. I'm not going to bore you with all of that. So much of it is obvious. But that led to the a uh, received perception that exists to this day that bilingualism confuses children, makes them less intelligent, and it's not a good idea. So you go, I went back and I read this literature and a couple points are, first of all, it all relied on standard intelligence tests. And there were even some reviews of this literature, one published as recently as 1963, because this really was first half of 20th century stuff. Um, and she said, oh, here's another study, and here's another study, and I see it's terrible, it's a terrible time. But then she noticed, hmm, she said, I see that when the tests are verbal, then it really is the case that the bilingual kids do more poorly. Well, I acknowledge that, right? But when the tests are nonverbal, they usually do pretty well. Often the same as the monolinguals, and in a few cases, even better. 
She published that in 1963, and nobody ever paid the slightest attention to it because the public interpretation, the sort of take-home story that had been established by the studies leading up to that point was already ground in stone. So the interesting thing was, even then they knew, even then they knew that if you give nonverbal intelligence tests to monolingual and bilingual children, there's no difference. And if anything, the bilingual kids might do better. So historically, there's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that leads into this underlying um, anti-bilingual bias. Yeah, um, thankfully we have come come away from that now, but uh, it is true that we still- I we still disagree. <laughs> we have not. We have not. I'm going to tell you about a study that was published about a month ago in a developmental journal. This was a study by a group in Florida. Um, and they looked at kids who were, I think, four or five years old at the time of the study. And half of the children were monolingual English speakers and half were English Spanish bilinguals. Florida has a huge Hispanic population. There's Spanish everywhere on the streets. But for those uh, residents of Florida who speak Spanish, that's their language. It's what they speak. It's their family language. And there's a lot of Spanish in Florida. Now, the little twist on the study was that they were following up on these cognitive tasks for kids who had been born premature because there's reason to believe that premature babies have different or slower cognitive development. So these kids are now four to six years old. They give them these cognitive tasks. They, care, they compare the monolingual and bilingual children, and they're the kinds of tasks that bilingual children typically do better in, and the bilingual children in this study did better. We got that you know, nice significant effect. Then they spoke to the parents. And 100%, 100%, every one of the families of the bilingual children said, when they brought their baby home from the hospital, the hospital staff told them not to speak Spanish, a hundred percent. And this is their language. These are Hispanic parents in Florida, which is very bilingual, and a hundred percent were told not to speak Spanish because their child was at risk. So it hasn't gone away. No. It it hasn't gone away, alas, and we know uh, by many families that we we help mm -hmm. with this. I would like to introduce also uh, or to ask another question or a comment from Polyglot uh, Mohammed. He says, if a family, and this relates to what you just said, uh, Ellen, if a family had a baby in a foreign country and that country doesn't speak that language they speak, should the parents focus on teaching their kid his native language only? and then he or she will learn the country's language afterwards or teach both equally, so. Right, okay, so this is, a, this is an important question because it's a question that, that so many families face, right? Um, so first of all, I really don't like rules, language rules about who's allowed to speak what to who. The purpose of language is communicating and as we mentioned, but not really discussed a few times, communicating is more than just linguistic and cognitive. It's social, it's empathic, it's establishing relationships and so on. So you have to communicate in the language that allows you to convey all of that, not just, I want more apple juice, mommy. So if you are a heritage language family, in a community that speaks a different language. Um, and again, I'm not giving you rules, but I would say that as much as possible, you should be using your heritage language at home because as soon as the child leaves the house and goes to um, you know, school or childcare, or heads out into the world, they'll learn the other language, they'll learn it just fine. 
but what you want to sort of prioritize, I would say, in those early years is your own heritage language because you are the only access the child has. Don't worry about the other one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, I think that is so important because um, we get that question often and then, and the parents do it because they want uh, the best for their child and they they uh, think and and especially then if they get the advice from their doctor or for someone else that yeah you should and even some teachers i'm afraid tell pa tell parents that they should speak the school language even if the parents don't know that language that well themselves so it's understandable that 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 parents feel like that and that's why it's so it, this message is so important that it, you stick to your language because that's where your child will get that input and be able to to grow up speaking that language like you say the other language will come well you know i i want to just take this moment to say that is why i believe that the work that you are doing is so important because you are the ones who are providing the real information to families what they're getting from these so-called authorities is often wrong like the example i just gave you and, and as you all heard so you know there's a real need to get the right information out to parents so they can make good decisions i'll give you one more anecdote you know the other uh, you mentioned teachers so as soon as a child shows um some kind of difficulty in school and it doesn't even have to be like a learning disability, but I, I'll talk about that in a minute. Even if it's, you know, the grades aren't outstanding, the educational experts will say to the parents, oh, that's because uh, she's bilingual. You have to stop speaking that other language at home. And parents who take authority seriously may try to do that. So. Kathy Koenig, who is, has this great dual expertise, she is an excellent researcher and a qualified speech language pathologist who works with bilingualism um, and has written a fabulous book that I recommend to everybody who has to understand the role of language disability in bilingualism, says it very simply. So you take a bilingual child who has a learning disability and you take away one of the languages, what do you get? You get a monolingual child with a learning disability. How is that any better? So, I mean, it's to completely miss the point that the learning disability is not because the child is speaking two languages and it's to completely abdicate responsibility for addressing what the child needs as learning support. Absolutely, Absolutely. fantastic. Um, so fascinating. <laughs> and uh, I hate to do this every week. I have to be the party pooper. <laughs> <laughs> the time we are approaching uh, over five minutes to the hour. We still have a few questions. Uh, Rita, Uta, what do you think? Uh, uh, I mean, I don't think we can address them all. Perhaps we take one more, uh, one final one. Uh, one final one, if it fits in with the, with, with the, the, the topic. And yes. um, we will get back to everyone who's asked a question. So if we, if we do not answer your question now, now on the on this session, we will, be on Facebook and answer in the comments. So yes. yeah. We will try our best to, to get to them. Did you have one in mind, Tetsu, you wanted to ask? If we go in order, this uh, this is not a topic that we talked about very recent. Well, I mean, near the end, but a little earlier, I think uh, it's, a, it's a more general question. Is it easier? This is from Joanna. Is it easier for bilinguals or multilinguals to learn yet another language? So I think it has to do with the brain capacity. Um, so 
sort of referring more to the earlier okay, topics that we were talking about. I got a really short answer to that, okay? <laughs> and it will leave us all in a kind of an upbeat mode. So in general, um, the view, again, a lot of it is anecdotal, but there are actual scientific studies that show it is in fact true. It is in fact true. So really? there are these people in, but, but we just have completed a study with this very cute result. We looked at uh, Canadian children uh, longitudinally from first grade when they're six years old um, to second grade and then third grade. And the model is that none of these children speak French at home and all of the education is in French. So they're learning French. Now, um, half of these kids that we've been following were monolingual, they speak English at home, their only French is in school, but about half of them are bilingual in that they speak something else at home, not English, not French, something else. So we tested how much French they're learning each year. They're in the same classrooms, with the same teacher, learning French in the same way. And it starts very slowly, but by the third year, it is the bilingual kids who have surged past and are learning more French than the monolingual kids. So this whole process of just adding on another language, they're doing better. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Wow. It's really close wow. to home and it's quite convincing. I, I, I didn't know how one would <laughs> test that because I get asked a, a lot and or I get, you know, I get told that, well, you, you already know, you know, th this language, that language. So it's easier for you to learn another language. And I always say, how, how do you prove that? <laughs> I, I've never lived the life of a monolingual, so I don't know. How would you prove that? But uh, oh. There is research. There's pretty good research too, even with adults, showing that that's the case. Okay. Well, Thank, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Bialystok. Uh, before uh, Ellen, um, I mean, uh, uh, Rita, if you want to ask for the final message, I oh, do see one comment from Josie uh, requesting for the book. Uh, is this something we can answer very quickly? Uh, uh, the book. Uh, uh, the, the book about learning difficulties. The... Oh, 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 oh okay. Yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have it at hand. Our name is oh, no, no, okay. no worries. After, yes. No worries, Ellen. What we will do, we will add it in the comments and we will okay. add it in the show notes afterwards. So, so we'll keep in okay. touch. We'll email and you can send that later. No, no worries at yes, all. No, but no what problem. I would like to like from you, Ellen, is is uh, with all the you are, you've been a fountain of knowledge. I'm so thankful that you came to our our broadcast. Um, what would you like to share with the parents? Some, some of the wisdom that you've gathered along the, the years? I guess what I want to say most is uh, a point I've made a couple of times, and that is the reason you want your children to learn another language is not because it may or may not make them smarter. That's not a reason to do this. You don't, you don't teach your kid a language so that they'll do better on a scoop test or they'll know that apples don't actually grow on noses. <laughs> That's not the reason. The reason is because language is our social connection to our worlds, our families, and our heritage. And if you don't learn the language that reflects your culture and your past and your history, that allows you to speak to your grandparents and eat those foods and understand why they're important, then you're missing an important piece of who you are in the world. So I think the real benefit of bilingualism is bilingualism. It's the language piece that connects you to the world and to your own heritage and place in it. Wonderful, thank you. What a wonderful ending for today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Simple but effective message. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, so before we wrap up, uh, I have a, a few, uh, a little announcement. Uh, well, I mean, before announcing the next speaker, let me just remind everybody that we do have a little feedback form that uh, if you could take just a few minutes to fill out for us so that we could deliver uh, to you better products uh, week after week or session after session. So I'm going to put this into the uh, chat box right now. Uh, and I have 
whoop, and I will pin this for you guys. So definitely please take a, just a few minutes, click on that and give us some valuable feedback. So let me go right on ahead to share this, my screen and uh, tell you about our next guest coming up. Okay. So, uh, our next guest for the first time, uh, I think uh, in, uh, in the past few weeks, we have um, a parent who is right in the, uh, in the middle of raising two children, uh, one of six years old and three years old. So uh, he's not our typical, I, I, I would say, academic expert. Uh, he is somebody who's, uh, he's a polyglot in who he has developed an app called OptiLingo. So he's my good friend, John T. Yamisha. And uh, he has been raising his children in a language called Circassian. Now this is a, a, an endangered language. Not many people speak it around the world. I think a few hundred thousand people. So uh, it's a very unique case. Uh, will be a model case for anybody who is trying to raise their children in languages that are less accessible than, than I would say the, the majority languages, English, uh, French. Uh, so I think it uh, will be very insightful. Uh, I hope you guys will come and uh, talk to J John T, ask him questions about how he goes about uh, making, uh, getting his materials to teach his kids. So in two weeks, September 15th, at the same time, 1 p.m. New York, 6 p.m. London, and 7 p.m. Uh, Paris, we will have Jaunty Yamisha to come talk to us uh, about raising kids with rare languages. All right, so that's it uh, from us today. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Bialystok, for your insights. And uh, we will see everybody again here in two weeks, September 15th. Please come back to the same channel. Thank All right. You. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye.